Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody um, to RBCM at Home Summer. My name is Jenny Arnold and I am a digital educator here at the Royal BC Museum. And as I was saying before, um, some of you may recognize my voice as the behind the scenes person during the um, seven months I've been helping with the RBCM at Home series. But for the summer, I will be helping being host for the RBCM at home summer programs on Fridays. So I'm very excited to talk and interact with you a little bit more and also learn with you and everyone joining more about our province. Um, the museum is located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, Songhees and Esquimalt nation. Um, I am an uninvited guest here on this land and it is my honor and privilege to be able to work live and play here and consider this my home. This province, we are gifted with so many natural beauties all around the province and today we will be taking a look at some of these natural beauties and I am joined with a couple of guests as well. We will be doing a story first and then we'll be practicing our drawing skills by looking at a specimen as reference. And so if you do not have a pen or paper or a pencil, pencil crayons, now is a great time to go and grab those things. Um, again, this is a webinar format, so we cannot hear or see you. Um, but if you have any questions or comments about what we're doing, please, if you're on Zoom, please use the comment section or the Q&A. And then on Facebook Live, on the comment section. So I will be looking at all of those things. So hopefully I don't miss any of those. And our first guest that we have today is Chris O'Connor, who is up in the galleries. A lot of you recognize him as the host of our BCM at Home Kids program. And he's also a learning program developer here at the museum. Hello, Chris. Oh, you're muted currently. So you just need to unmute yourself and then we'll see you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm not used to being on this side of things, so <laughs> thank you, Jenny. Um, Definitely. And it's so nice to it's so nice to have you as a host of well, RBCM you. at Home Summer uh, for these Fridays. It's it makes me so happy. Yay. Um, so so I am up here in the galleries on on the second floor. The second floor is the Natural History um, Gallery and our special exhibition, which right now is the Orcas exhibition. Um, and I love this floor so much because there's so many different areas to go into and explore and feel like if you can't get out into nature to feel a little bit of a connection of being in nature. And one of the things I love about it as well is that there's so many different kinds of animals from the super, super small um, that you can't even see like a fairy fly that like I couldn't even see if it was on my finger, it's so small to something as large as a humpback whale. And the, this, this area that we're in is like, has animals that span that whole um, diversity of sizes, diversity of like ways of behavior. So what I wanted to do is start with a book, one of my favorite books, especially around seeing and um, being aware of our environment around us. And then I have, we do have a special guest here who's, um, an uh, amazing artist who's gonna guide us through different ways of looking at one animal in particular. So, but we're gonna start with, we're gonna start with this book, which is one of my favorite books, like I said, it's by Lizzie Boyd called Flashlight. This is a great book. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this character, she's walking through the, the forest and she has a flashlight and actually I have a flashlight too, which will be helpful a little bit later. So she's camping out. Um, and she has her flashlight and she goes around and she actually loses one of her boots. So she sees that boot with a flashlight. Then she sees some bats up high. She sees little mice down low. She sees a great curious owl up in the tree. She sees skunks and um, the, the, the little creek and the beaver and the plants that are, are growing along the creek there. She sees a porcupine and fish in the creek. She sees mushrooms and a fox. She even sees some signs of people maybe living by with prayer flags. And then there's some apples, some that are, 
already eaten on the ground, a deer, some other, now that, that she's starting to eat some of those apples. So she drops her flashlight and then she walks with her flashlight and trips and the flashlight is down on the ground. She's fine, it's okay, um, but the flashlight's on the ground. And what happens is now the flashlight is turned on her. <laughs> and the little raccoon there is like, what is this curious creature in the forest? And then the beaver also is curious about this curious creature and the other animals too. And they're all looking at her, wondering like who she is. And then the owl looks at all of them. So all the animals together, including uh, the human uh, in the forest. And then they go back to the tent and the little mice there are helping uh, her read in the tent there. And that's the end of that story. And I, I love this story as, as a kind of story that is perfect for the museum. Because, so I'm gonna get up. Oh, just so you know, just looking behind us, uh, where we are right now is the Inner Harbor, um, just looking out. So um, it's a beautiful spot within the, within the city here. I'm gonna put my mask back on as we start to go into the museum. Um, but looking, going through the museum and then also going through into nature, how we use our eyes and how we're exploring and what we're looking at and the questions we ask about what we're looking at, like why does that thing have that? Why does it move in that way? Are all really, really important questions. And it's the thing that I get most excited about with the museum. So I'm gonna turn the camera around so we could start to look before we get to our special guest and before we get to our specimen, we're looking above and I see with my flashlight, I see a great blue heron there. I am also seeing some humans, <laughs> um, but we'll pass by the humans quickly. Um, and I won't flash my flashlight in their faces. Okay. So I see a mammoth there. I'm going around now. So with my flashlight, there's lots of people here too, which is great. So nice to see a full museum again. People are probably wondering why I'm talking to myself, <laughs> not realizing that I'm on a camera. Um, and then we're in the forest here. And the, the area we're gonna go to is right in this special little room that we have. And this is our, our special little room with our special, not little guest, our special big guest, um, Gareth Godin. Hi, so so oh, Gareth is a, a, yeah. Oh no, go ahead. It, Oh, so yeah, Jenny, do you want to say? Yeah, so Gareth Godin is um, a very exciting guest that we have here today. Um, he is an award-winning cartoonist, comic book creator, and is the owner of Legend Comics and Books down here in Victoria, which I have gone frequently. I have many books from your store, so it's very exciting to see you. I also hear that um, you were a two-year term as the artist in residence here at the Royal BC Museum before. And we're excited to have you here and to show us a little bit about drawing. And you'll show us some examples of your drawing as looking at some nature in our exhibit. Indeed, thank you so much for the introduction. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm, I was invited to draw this bear. I don't know if you want to pan over <laughs> Yeah, I do. Look how cool this is. So I, I sat down and realized that's a really big bear. And I didn't know where to start. So I tried um, drawing the bear by stepping back and looking at it all at once, but it got a little hard because it would get too big for the page. So the first thing I've done. Sorry, I'm just going to close the door just so we get here. Is so instead of being overwhelmed by the size of the bear, I decided to zoom in close and I drew his eye first. And just to see if I could maybe get a piece of what he looked like. I have a couple different colored markers and just looking at his eye closely, he started drawing. And I drew his claw and his snout. And it made it seem not so big. 
and not as intimidating. It's intimidating to draw a big bear in all that hair. I was thinking, do I have to draw hair? But this is what I've decided to do. I have just kind of roughly broken down the shapes of the bear. He looked like he had a, a cube for a head maybe. And a little, what do they call that? A cylinder for a snout. And his little ears would stick there. And there might've been a triangle there for his neck. And it, his shoulder is the biggest part. It's like a big oval. And then we've got a little circly oval there. Everything's draped in fur, so it might be fun to draw later. So I just kind of broke it down to basic shapes. His belly is the funniest part because he's got this slouch at the top and then this droop at the bottom. I don't even know what kind of shape that is. It's an egg hanging off a wire maybe. And then his hind leg, it's got another coolie oval that's attached and his legs kicking off like a dancer. So I just kind of broke it down to shapes. That's the first thing I did. But then, based on the shapes, I tried to just add a little character. So I just figured out where his eyes were in relation to his body to sketch them in. And I think what I'll do now is go at it with a, my brush and see if I can turn that into a fun drawing that looks like a bear rather than a bunch of so, sketches. Gareth, can we can you hold that up in front of the the bear there? Mm. Yeah. So can you describe those shapes again? For those who are drawing from home, um, can you describe those shapes again? So the head is this giant head and I figured it's an odd shape. So I thought maybe if I broke it down to like a cube, like an ice cube, I penciled an ice cube in behind his head. And then there's a cylinder, like a jam jar on his nose. And I just kind of put those pieces together. And then looking at the bear, what it, the biggest part is this shoulder. He's got that round, big arm that's full of muscle. Especially this being the grizzly bear. Yeah, the grizzly, of... that's where all the grizzle is, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how to grizzle something. And I like the little <laughs> attachment. So then once I've got those pieces together, I looked at his head. And so from his eye up is a nice curved line that kind of goes down a bit from his head and then up again. And then the big hump of his shoulder. It's like a, it's kind of like a whale coming out of the water. But then unlike a whale, it goes back down in this giant swoop. And then back up again for his rump. And I, I like- So if you're drawing, if you're drawing at home, you could start to do the, like those shapes, Gareth was talking about the, the cube and the, the, for the head, but then the, the, the line above, right? Yeah, I just, it's intimidating drawing something you've never drawn before, firstly. But if you look at everything in the world just as shapes, like a person is a circle for a head, a little rectangle for the body, and then the little arm sticking off. But anytime you break it down to the basic shapes, you can just start building off of it. The coolest thing for a drawing is the negative space too, like the back legs are in shadow to me. So I kind of can tell that that back one's in there. But instead of worrying about what the leg looked like, I thought it found it easier to look what the space between the legs looked like. And that's this space. Almost like a triangle. Yeah, with these little rump bumps. I always think of, when I look at negative space of a drawing, there's another one here. I think of the states or the provinces. This one might oh, yeah. be <laughs> Manitoba. Yeah. So, because I'm right-handed, I don't have a very good grasp of um, memory. So I have to actually look at the thing and then draw while I'm looking at it. But then I might lose sight of my fingers. But if I think, oh, it looks like British Columbia, then I kind of know what British Columbia looks like. Or this, the front, where, where I'm, from where I'm sitting, a negative space between his front paws is a really good triangle. Kind of reminds me of Mount Everest. <laughs> so I've got this uh, peak, but it's different from where you are. A foot away changes the angle. So these little negative spaces help me get the positive space a little better. And Jenny, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, there was just a question about um, from Holly on Facebook of how large the bear is. And I believe that this is a full grown grizzly male bear, I believe. Yeah, it's a full grown male grizzly bear. Oh, that's I'm perfect. Thank you for reference. Male. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. would never like to be in this position. <laughs> 
It's one of the things about the museum is that you're allowed to like get really close to animals that you probably wouldn't want to get this close to in in real life. But this is an actual specimen. So this this is a bear, a full grown male bear. They do get larger than this, um, but this is a good size male uh, grizzly bear. But great question, because it's yeah. hard to get a sense of how big big something is. Definitely. And Holly says, thank you for clarifying yeah. it is. It's, it's hard to it's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and just for a contrast too. So that's a big male, um, full grown bear. This right here is a cub, a grizzly bear cub. So and this is a beaver. So the cub is smaller than a full grown beaver. And then it grows into it grows into that size. All right, so we're we've added some lines. I'm having some of my black. I just have a black ink pen, so I can. So Garrett, do you always start with pencil, just just so you can make lots of different lines? Yeah, pencil is the way to go because I I'm the first my first draft. It was not good. Well, I wasn't happy with it. I'm happy. It's kind of it was good because I learned from it. But I drew his head too big compared to the rest of his body. And I knew he wouldn't fit on the page. So if I did it in pen, I think I would have invested too much time before I realized the mistake. Yeah. So pencil really helps you um, just rough it in and make all the mistakes you want. And they're easily fixed with an eraser. Or in this case, I just move on to another piece. So Chris, do you mind just um, showing the bear for a little bit longer? There's a question about what bear we're supposed to draw. So they, for people who yeah. are watching, now is your time to start with those shapes of trying to draw the bear. So Chris, if you could just have it on the screen for about a minute or two, that may Great. help um, viewers be able to draw that. So yes, now is sure. your time and then to draw. I, I will keep this here and then Gareth can show uh, the drawing just from this vantage point at different times. So Perfect. As, as you're sketching it, this bear, just think about that shape is what the, comes out the most to me, the big A. And then the little cylinder here. I don't want to touch the bear. Right? Actually, you can touch it. It's oh, okay. Yeah. It's still scary. It might come alive. <laughs> and then I was talking about how funny this looks. The big hump, and then it comes back to So that's a nice little, imagine a saddle on this bear riding it around. And the weight of the, the belly makes a shape that I don't even know the name of, an oval of some sort. I guess he's just a lot of ovals. <laughs> and once you just do a few sketches of those shapes, you bear might come into come into shape on your page. Can you talk about the head again? Because you said it like a can or a yeah, cylinder. Drew, in my head, this part here was an ice cube. So there's a flat part, a flat part, a flat part straight there. So like a lunch kit, mm. a big one. But on front, the front of it is a, a jar, a mayonnaise jar or something. No disrespect, <laughs> but those are just the shapes I've broken it down to. Sometimes when I was in art school, one of the things they taught me was to get a pencil and what you're looking at, draw on your page as if the tip of your pencil is a B and the thing you're looking at is just an empty vessel. Mm. And by the B flying around in the vessel, bumping into the sides, will eventually form what you wanted to draw. That was just an interesting way to picture roughing in a drawing. So I'm not worrying about the outline shape. I'm worrying about the volume, I guess. So that big oval might be a mess of sketches. But once you've flown around inside it with your pencil, you know where it, where it ends. His head, it's, that's one of the more difficult things I've ever drawn. So much, so much detail and so many little crevices that I would only worry about that at the end of hours of drawing. Mm. I think that's a very important thing to mention is that don't get stuck on the details right away. You just need, again, break, breaking it down to the shapes and making it more um, easier to digest when you do it in parts and then eventually go back to it. I think it's a very important thing that for myself, I'm not a, uh, I don't think I'm a great drawer, but that type of mentality of just piece by piece, I find has really helped. Brilliant. So as a couple of examples, if I draw, any idea what that is? 
Ooh. A chair? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could spend an hour drawing a really detailed chair, but or I could just draw the, a cartoon of a chair, and you know what I'm talking about. That's so, a boat. So yeah. <laughs> the whole point of getting your information across is if some, if you want to tell somebody you saw a bear today, you could spend a week drawing a bear, or you could draw. Worst bear ever, but oh, the claws really win it. You can just get your point across. So there's no good and bad in art. There's just art that you spend a lot of time on or art that you've just done quickly to get your point across. And maybe like understanding that certain animals have certain features too that are just, that distinguish it. Like once you did the ears for that, I knew, okay, that's not a, that's not a, a, a dog, it's All a, right. If I draw a cat with his little pointed ears, that's a cat. But if I drew rabbit ears on it, it becomes a different animal. Or if there's antlers, completely different again. So there's always little um, traits to any animal that or that helps a, a cartoonist get the point across. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when we asked what people's favorite animals to draw, like a cat or a unicorn or birds, those have very distinct features that um, it's quite accessible for people to be able to draw because people know those things specifically. And I imagine for you, Gareth, as well, like being a comics artist and, and an artist in general, that you are in, you, you don't have to stick to reality in a way that maybe if you're just a, a straight sort of natural history sketch right. artist, you're trying to get all the details in a, in a realistic way, but it's exactly. it's nice sometimes to, to go away from reality sometimes too. One of the things that upset me about learning art in art school, I'm looking at a bear and I drew an elephant. One of the <laughs> things that I learned was that for 10,000 years, humans practiced and studied and learned how to draw realism. They figured shadow and light and, and painting skin. And, they, and by the time people mastered it, thousands of years into human evolution, somebody came along and invented the camera, which made everything obsolete. So if you want something to look perfect, you can take a photo of it. But if you want an artist to do it, cartoon, that's where it's at. <laughs> I agree with that. I'm just going to put in the chat. There's um, on the learning portal, we have something about drawing nature, which is more a bit more about the being all detail oriented and all that stuff. But again, like cartoons have such value to them. And we have a comment that says that they like when they were drawing to use ovals and circles to get the outline of the grizzly bear. They really liked that. Excellent. Yeah. And plus we're drawing because it's fun. And we're drawing because we want to express ourselves. We're not drawing so that we can think, oh, I didn't do a very good job. I feel bad about myself. It's the worst thing ever. Drawing to one good drawing involves a thousand bad drawings in your mind that you did previously. Every drawing you did when you were two with a crayon on the wall inspired the masterpiece that you will or feel like doing in your life. Every line you, you draw, be it um, even if you're a skateboarder. When I think of skateboarding in the skate park, I'm drawing a line around the cement with my board. And it's just all the way I look at things. So I, all my cartoon heroes seem to be left-handed and I'm right-handed. So sometimes I wonder what's the difference. <laughs> so I switched to my left hand and started drawing it. And I, I, I'm not very good at it because it, make, it makes me feel kind of twitchy, but I see the world in a different perspective. Mm. So when I'm drawing with my right hand and I look at the bear, I think, oh, I know what his paw looks like. So I just start drawing a paw, but it's not the paw that I'm looking at because my brain thinks it knows better sometimes. Mm. But if I draw with my wrong hand and I'm looking at the paw, this hand doesn't know what a paw looks like. So it draws exactly what I'm looking at. It's a good experiment sometimes if you, if you have a flower and a vase on your desk and you wanna do a, a portrait of it, a little still life, spend five minutes with your right hand or your opposite hand and just switch back and forth and see which one um, gives you the most interesting results. Mm. That's really interesting because when you do something that is unfamiliar, like drawing with your less dominant hand, then it makes you focus a little bit more and mm -hmm. having to look at the details, definitely. Mm -hmm. And also with the thing that you're drawing can really impact how much effort or how much um, detail you put in. Because I know you've done quite a few comics, comics that 
are um, the subjects in it are your daughters. And that must be, make sure, make sure to put some detail and have more passion about what you're drawing because it's something that you care about. Yeah, my daughters and I started the comic book series in 2013 called The Monster Sisters. And in it, they're swinging around Victoria going to all their favorite places like the museum. But- Yeah, they visit Old Town and- Yeah, they do. But eight years later, I'm still drawing them with the same t-shirts. And, and one of them has a striped shirt on, the other one's got a little yellow t-shirt. And my kids are grown up a little and they're like, why are we still wearing those clothes? And I said, well, in the story, it's all the same day. You've been swinging all over. So I don't want you to have changed. So they're, <laughs> they're looking at the details like, well, I think we would have changed our hair by now. Or we <laughs> I think those pants are out of style. So detail is interesting, but you also have to remember if you're doing a story, it's, it might have all been in one moment. Okay, I'm drawing the shadowy leg now. Let's see what happens there. A family circus, is that the one that the, they've been the same for like 40 years? Yeah, I grew up <laughs> with that cartoon, I loved yeah. it. The family circus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm putting, I put my sh the ink shape around and then I've got a, a gray marker, so I was just putting in some shadow just to make me step, every time I step back and look at it, I can either feel um, proud or I could feel it's not finished or I could think where, what needs it next I guess that foot probably needs some effort but the face might be the hardest so I might procrastinate on that but I do like the claws they're most, the most most fun to draw I just kind of put them in the shadow really makes a big difference huh? it does it just, like it? pops has it pop off the page a bit more and it helps you there's I don't get to draw any fur in there later because it's just darkness yeah but if I've gone at it and and I feel like like down here under his chin, it looks like there's some fluffy fur. So it's drawing a different style, the little lines there. I know his bottom of his back leg, there's some fur flying off it. That's just the type of detail I'm thinking about. And then if you were doing this as a comic and it's running fast across the, uh, through the forest. Right, there's cartooning things. You could have the motion lines or you could have the speed lines or a little cloud. Or I could have a word balloon, having them say something to turn it into comics. Or I could have, what else could be? But each of his legs could, I could have one leg here and this leg down there and then where his legs were. Give a sense of motion that yeah, way. Yeah, there's lots of different ways that could be done. Or maybe even if his fur was blowing off. Oh yeah, yeah. Kind of. But since it's short fur, you wouldn't see it too much. Right. But they like to do speed lines in comics to show things are moving. Uh -huh. Yeah, I find comics are great with being able to show movement. Yeah, there's so many things in comics that, um, like the little sweat drops that come off of somebody when they're surprised, or um, if you get bumped on the head in the cartoon, there's little birds flying around, or or the little circles above someone's head and then pop circles, like they've just woken up. I have a question, Gareth, maybe before we end here. Um, Wait, as a comics artist, and if you're creating a new piece like the Monster Sisters, mm -hmm. and, and that's maybe like a good example because it came out of your daughters and you're uh, imagining them as as superheroes, or maybe they already are superheroes. Right. Um, would you would you start with a character like say you you wanted to do a comic about a bear that you would you would start with just like trying to understand the bear by doing lots of drawings of it and then started to put it into some kind of story that like have it live in the world in a certain way? Is it is it helpful to sort of understand characters uh, tried, before starting the story? No, well, it probably would be if you're at the end of your career and you're deciding to finally get down and do a big story. But for me, my whole life I've been a cartoonist and, and making comics. So the, one of the things is to come up with a character that you don't mind drawing over and over. So if it's you, that's always a fun thing to draw and make it. I wanted to be Spider-Man, the Spider-Man artist, mm. but his webs took so long. So I ended up being pairing my characters down to this a cat who looked <laughs> so simple. Speaking of animals. So my, my, my main character I drew was called the Froggy Cat. And it was just basically that, no mouth, no ex expression. And so that if I did a hundred pages of this cat walking through the city, and talking to people, it wasn't hard to constantly draw. So try to pare down a character to something that's manageable. Yeah. But then draw it enough times from different angles that you're comfortable. But then that's what professionals tell you to do. But I think just draw, if you're gonna do a comic, draw the, the comic the way you can do it right now. 
don't wait until you're good enough. Don't wait until your character is well developed. Just draw a bunch of panels and draw your story. Write and draw it and, and, and be done and be happy because you'll, you'll have learned more from that than waiting until you were good enough to do it. Mm. Um, no one's ever good enough to do something. They either do it or they don't. Yeah. And the only way to get better at something is to have done it. So don't hesitate. If you want to draw a comic story, just do it. And I would imagine like, especially Pierogi Cat, who has had so many adventures over the, the years, it's just like, it's a simple drawing, but it has taken on a really, um, like an amazing personality. Yeah, <laughs> just people, from people know the cat, and I'm I'm here because of that cat. That's yeah. how we met. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's art, like the beautiful art that's on the walls here, and it has a purpose. Every all art has a purpose, but if you don't see yourself doing something that vast and grand on the wall of a museum, um, you can be just as vital to the art community by drawing tracing your hand on a piece of paper and turning it into a turkey. Yeah. It's all art and you, we all have the same skills. Mm. Practice. And I, and I just put in your Instagram account in the chat as well, so people can see some of your drawings that you, because I believe you still do almost as of a comic a day. Yeah. Yeah. The Gareth underscore Godin has my daily cartoons on there. Which might involve a bear. Yeah. But today will be a bear for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, Gareth. Oh, my great pleasure. Thanks for being here. Happy drawing, everyone. Um, come see me anytime. I'll be at the museum as, the, as much as they'll allow me. And uh, <laughs> drawing is the best part of my life, so I hope you can share that too. Thank you so much for showing us your wonderful skills and telling us a little bit more about how you can draw things and how all type of art is important. And you just got to do it. That's the important thing is you got to start doing it. So thank you everyone so much for joining us here today for RBCM at Home Summer. Um, we hope to see you next week. And until then, take care of one another and we'll see you next time. <laughs>